Do you know someone with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia? If you don't yet, chances are you will. Mm -hmm. These are diseases that are occurring at an ever-increasing rate in our aging population. Uh, and it's a, these diseases that will touch all of us, either as, as sufferers or as the, the caregivers who are taking care of people who, who have dementia or Alzheimer's. And unfortunately for these uh, devastating diseases, right now there's, there's no known cures and not even good ways to treat the symptoms. Um, and we can't do experiments in humans to try to understand how these diseases arise and, and develop new, new strategies for treating them, because that wouldn't be ethical. Instead, the, the best way to, to understand how these diseases develop and develop uh, treatment strategies is to try to reproduce the disease in, in animals, to create animal models of Alzheimer's disease and of other forms of dementia, and use these animals to understand how neurons die and, and how other brain functions are, are affected, and then use these animals as a, as a way to test new therapeutic strategies that could rescue the cognitive function that's lost as a result of these devastating pathologies. So clinically, in, in humans, it's been noted that the incidence of small regions of dead brain tissue, these are less than a millimeter in size, or of small hemorrhages, these are, these are capillaries in the brain, and here some of the blood has leaked out into the surrounding brain tissue. So these kinds of lesions, either little pockets of tissue that have died due to a clot in a blood vessel that leads to loss of blood flow, both of these kinds of lesions are associated with an increased risk for developing dementia, things like Alzheimer's disease, as well as with uh, a more precipitous cognitive decline as people age. So to study a disease like this and understand the molecular and cellular mechanisms that lead to this loss of, neuro, of neural health and to the loss of cognitive function uh, seen in, in humans, what, what's really necessary is to reproduce this disease in an animal model with high fidelity so that we can study the, the disease mechanisms and then develop and test therapeutic strategies in animals. But the problem is that the, the vasculature that's, that's implicated are these tiny little blood vessels in the brain. So this is a cross-section of the brain of a, of a rat where the vessels have been labeled by injecting a black ink. Um, and it's these small little vessels that plunge from the brain surface down into the tissue or even these individual little capillaries down in the brain that are responsible for these small strokes. And so as you can imagine, it's just very difficult to be able to go in and and block one of these tiny blood vessels or cause one of them to hemorrhage. Uh, the vessels are just too small to manually manipulate. So in my lab and, and working with uh, my former postdoc advisor at UC San Diego, David Kleinfeld, we've developed tools to be able to produce occlusions in targeted blood vessels when and where we want. Uh, so we use nonlinear optical tools both to uh, visualize and see what we're doing in the brains of rodents as well as to manipulate things and cause small strokes. So this, for example, is uh, the principle of a technique called two-photon excited fluorescence microscopy, which we use to be able to image into the brains of rodents. So we fluorescently label structures of interest in the brain. Either we label the blood vessels or neurons uh, with, a, with a dye that, that when it absorbs light of one color, it emits light of a, of a different color, a fluorescent dye. And then we use very short pulses of laser light focused down into the, the brain to excite this fluorescent dye in one small three-dimensionally localized spot. Because the dye is excited in only one spot, any fluorescence that we record we know must have come from that one spot. So to do these experiments we, uh, we remove a small section of the skull in an anesthetized mouse and replace it with a thin piece of glass. This gives us optical access to the brain where we can we can use light both to image and manipulate the, the tissue uh, underneath the craniotomy. This is a, a movie where we're doing this two-photon excited fluorescence microscopy after injecting a fluorescent dye into the bloodstream of the animal. So we're starting up at the surface of the brain and then scanning down deeper and deeper into the brain. And all of the blood vessels are fluorescently labeled by this intravenous injection of fluorescent dye. So I'm going to go back and go through this, this movie again. And up near the, the surface, you'll see blood vessels on the surface of the brain, arteries and venules. And then as we step down, you're actually seeing the individual capillaries down inside the brain. Uh, 
And you'll notice that there's little black dots that seem to be moving around inside those capillaries. So those black dots are actually red blood cells. So the dye that we inject labels only the plasma component of the blood, not the red blood cells. So I hope I've convinced you that we can gain optical access to the brain of a rodent and using nonlinear microscopy we can visualize the blood vessels in their brain. In order to study the small strokes that are associated with dementia, we now need to be able to make some of those blood vessels stop flowing when and where we want. In order to do this, we use short laser pulses to injure individually targeted blood vessels, and that injury initiates the clotting cascade and leads to the formation of a clot that stops blood flow. And it turns out that we, we pick a laser wavelength where the brain is, is uh, relatively transparent. So this is infrared light. So most of the light just passes right through the, the tissue. But right here in the focal region, because we're focusing the light very tightly, and because we have such a short pulse, the intensity of the light is extremely high. In fact, it's like taking all of the light that comes from the sun and focusing it onto a spot about the size of a dime. But that high intensity only exists for about 100 femtoseconds. Just for perspective, the ratio between 100 femtoseconds and a minute is about the same as the ratio between a minute and the known age of the universe. So this is an extremely short burst of light. So right in this focal region, for this very short uh, period of time, the laser intensity becomes so high that it basically rips the material apart, whatever it is that's there. But that only happens in about a one micrometer sized volume that's located right at this laser focus. In some sense, you can think of this as a laser scalpel that can make cuts that are on the order of uh, a tenth of the size of a single cell. So we're making cuts that are on the order of the size of cells, and they're located uh, a millimeter beneath the tissue surface without causing any collateral damage. And the way we do this is we use this laser scalpel to cause an injury on a targeted blood vessel. And just like when you cut your hand and that injury initiates clotting, the same thing happens here. So this injury that we produce in this blood vessel initiates the clotting cascade and it leads to the formation of an occlusion. But only that one blood vessel that we, that we injured is clotted. So this is a movie of the, the clotting process. So this is a small arterial, four or five hundred microns underneath the surface of the brain in a mouse. It's moving around a little bit because of heartbeat. And you can see this streaked appearance inside the vessels. That's due to the motion of red blood cells. And now we're focusing these laser pulses onto this vessel and causing a little bit of injury. And you can see it's being injured because it's starting to bleed. Some of the fluorescent dye is bleeding out into the brain. And after we cause enough injury, you can see that streaked appearance has gone away in this vessel. So we've essentially stopped blood flow in this and only this vessel. So now we have what we need. We have an animal model for small strokes. We can pick a blood vessel when and where we want. We can cause it to clot, and we can look at the physiological impact of that clot on the brain. We can also look at, the, at, at cellular health. So in this case, we're actually, we have two things fluorescently labeled in the brain. In red is this intravenously injected fluorescent dye that labels the bloodstream. But then in green, there's a, uh, uh, we're actually looking at yellow fluorescent protein. Uh, and this, this is a mouse that's been genetically engineered so that this yellow fluorescent protein is expressed only in neurons in the brain. And we're looking here at the individual dendrites that, uh, that these neurons use to receive input. And it turns out that this, this normal dendrite structure, these very thin, long lines where there's lots of different connections coming in from different neurons, this structure takes a lot of energy to maintain. So there's a, there's a little skeleton, an actin-based cytoskeleton, inside these dendrites that keeps them in this position. And, it, and that skeleton, that, that uh, actin network, has to be constantly maintained, and that takes energy. So when we come in and we block this penetrating arterial, so we stop blood flow in this, this vessel, you can see that that structure degenerates, and all of these long cylinders sort of purl up into little round uh, balls. And so this kind of structure no longer supports the normal function of the brain. So this, this represents cells that have been severely injured. And these mice, we can actually let them wake back up and go and do their things and come back and image later. So here we're imaging a day later. The blood vessel is still clotted and all of these neurons are, have still 
uh, are still degenerated. And here, a month later, the blood vessel is actually flowing again, but if we look at the tissue in the brain, while there's been a little bit of recovery, there's still a large region where, uh, where cells are still dead and, and there's been no functional recovery. So these are cells that have died as a result of the stroke, and it's this kind of loss of neurons that's responsible for the cognitive decline associated with these small strokes. So one of the principal goals of this work is to try to understand the, the molecular and cellular pathways by which cells are injured after small strokes. And if those pathways could be identified and, and understood, then perhaps there's therapeutic strategies that could be developed that could intervene and stop the death and loss of function of neurons that underlies the cognitive de uh, decline associated with small strokes.